Welcome to WAVES. I'm glad to have this opportunity to speak to all of you. Um, my topic is going to be about the challenges that face uh, the study of ancient India, which is, of course, the focus of uh, um, the World Association of Vedic Studies. And these challenges uh, are due to um, complicated historical factors where um, Indologists who uh, started working on Sanskrit texts a couple of centuries ago uh, went through uh, a couple of phases. In the first phase, there was tremendous uh, attraction to what they had discovered and excitement about it and seeing it as the source of a lot of uh, Western uh, um, Indo-European stuff. But uh, subsequently, for a for many reasons, uh, partly because India was a uh, country under the heel of the British, uh, it was decided by Indologists, and there were other uh, uh, hegemonic uh, factors, it was decided that only Europeans or Indologists would have the authority to interpret India to themselves, and, uh, and therefore Indians will not have a, uh, a place at the academic table. And the way it was justified by the Indologists was that, look, Indians are very emotional about their past, and India is a uh, society or a civilization which is kind of decadent because uh, the Indo-Europeans, uh, according to their view, came into India about 1500 BC, and they came they brought in all these glorious ideas, which were eventually written down as the Vedas and the Upanishads. But subsequent to their intermingling with the races or the peoples of the Indian subcontinent, uh, it all went downhill. And it went downhill to superstition and um, caste hierarchy and oppression and all that. And in fact, this is a view which is held on by Indologists and um, their acolytes, which is uh, most of uh, Western educated people, both in the West and in India, which is one reason why there's so much, so much of hate for ancient India within Indian elite circles also, and which is how you can explain how Jack Dorsey, the founder of Twitter when he was in India last year, held up a big banner saying with his Indian assistants, saying down with uh, Brahmanical patriarchy. Uh, Jack Dorsey or anybody else would not dare to uh, be this pointed about any specific such group in any other part of the world. But ancient Indian history is a very emotional issue for Europe and America. Um, it's not that Every um, Western scholar is so biased and so blind, so to speak, to the facts. But And there are many great open-minded uh, scholars who have contributed to uh, Indian studies and Vedic studies over the past uh, several centuries. But I'm talking more of the academic control in recent past, where there is a alliance, so to speak, between the Indologists and the left and it's uh, driven partly by the desire of the left to destroy India as it stands, just as the left also wants to destroy other uh, cultures and civilizations and impose its uh, vision of a uh, mechanistic universe under the benign control of the elite, uh, which is what, of course, the Soviet Union was also an attempt at creating such a world. Now, uh, um, now of course, uh, when can, one can sort of uh, uh, laugh at it, uh, at the stupidity of these assumptions and the stupidity of the idea that somehow, uh, the, the racist idea that somehow there's something wrong with Indians as a people that they cannot uh, uh, interpret their own texts. And that's why only Europeans have the authority to do so. And it's it, faces, it flies um, completely um, in, 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 into, into the facts. Uh, for example, we all know Indians are 
as successful as any um, in uh, Western countries where there's a playing field. Indians are good at uh, sciences. There's nothing wrong with Indians. In fact, sciences, as we know, were to a great extent created in India. Uh, even modern science is rests on Indian foundations of uh, logic, of uh, infinite series, uh, of um, of, of course, uh, mathematics and algebra and the ideas of Brahmagupta and Bhaskaracharya about gravitation and, and many other ideas. And uh, let, let's not forget Kanada's um, laws of motion um, and his ideas of invariance and Aryabhata's idea of relativity. Of course, not we're not talking of um, the latest version of relativity, but he was quite aware that um, things were perceived differently by different observers. So, uh, so this is all, of course, ridiculous, and we can laugh at it. But uh, and and certainly, Indians are at the forefront of technology, and they are successful. And Indians are even the most successful ethnic group in the U.S. So, if you know whatever uh, is being uh, internalized or has been internalized is partly driven by this desire for hegemonic, hegemonic control that uh, Indians should not uh, be uh, telling and speaking up for themselves. And this is quite shameful. In fact, um, we are talking of or uh, the last several months have been this um, think about uh, the churning in the US that um, groups have not had uh, their voice heard which is why there's a lot of changes that are taking place. But just imagine a billion point three, uh, 1.3 billion strong people for strange reasons associated with colonialism and hegemony are not being uh, given uh, a voice. Um, and, and of course, they have their own um, um, uh, collaborators because they're a part of this academic um, uh, ecosystem in India, and uh, and so it's a struggle in India as well. Now, of course, uh, to be fair to uh, the Westerner scholars and even those who want uh, the control to continue to be with them, um, uh, to be fair to them, part of the problem is that Indian academics is in a bad state. Uh, a lot of the work that uh, is uh, published or done, not all, there are some great scholars in India as well, but a lot of the work is shoddy. Uh, there's not enough uh, um, enough manthan that has been done before people come out with uh, with their uh, with with their hypotheses or whatever. So it's rather superficial, and I'm quite sure that people all over because most great scholars are all open-minded and most scholars are open-minded if Indians were to start producing well-argued work um, uh, comprehensively um, that would change the paradigm so to a great extent it's the fault of the Indians themselves it's the fault of um, or, or, or a weakness of uh, uh, associations such as waves that uh, they have not been able to inspire their members to produce um, stuff, academic and more popular histories of the highest class, which would then uh, make a difference because everybody wants to be connected to the truth. Everybody wants, no matter which culture or civilization they come from, but what is required is um, argumentation, which is strong, and uh, that's where a lot uh, needs to be done because often there is this tendency uh, in India to, first of all, be obsessed with certain Puranic ideas which are not to be taken literally and perhaps be obsessed with uh, the long uh, chronologies uh, which are not to be taken literally that we have in the Puranas. And so there are many people then uh, pushing dates back to ten th tens of thousands of years for Indian texts um, and or taking one stray reference and not use the critical method because 
whenever you are saying something, you must have several interlocking pieces of evidence because the texts that have come to, come down to us could very well have been corrupted or maybe the context is not quite clear. So to take one statement in isolation and for that reason, to throw out all that there is in the academic world is not the best uh, that uh, a person can do. So uh, now part of the reason why this has happened in India is because uh, after independence, um, Mr. Nehru and his successors for various political reasons and for their own convictions, and uh, their convictions were uh, socialistic, they wanted uh, Indian society be to be remade, which is fine. Uh, you do want it to reform and to be modern, to be uh, uh, looking for change and to consider everybody equal, um, which, which in my view is, of course, um, uh, totally validated by the text. For example, this whole idea of um, uh, in the Purusha Sukta that um, from Purusha emerged, from the cosmic man emerge the Brahmins, the Kshatriyas or the Rajanyas, the Vaishyas and the Shudras. Now each human being has the Purush within him. So each human being ha is a um, is a intermingling or superposition of these four beings. Every human being, no matter what their background, no matter what social uh, background they come from, is a Brahman is a Kshatriya, is a Vaishya, and is a, is a Shudra. And in fact, wisdom for anyone emerges only through service. And this whole idea of, of over, um, over thinking or over abstraction, where you are attached to terms because they sound good, uh, is uh, a path to uh, no, no real fruit. Um, uh, so one must um, you know, look at all of these things rationally, uh, with a hard, uh, um, hard, you know, using logic to the extent one is possible. Now, of course, uh, within society, because society, no one section of the society is the entire being. You can consider the entire society to be integral, and therefore there are sections of society, sections of tasks, which could be mapped to these four uh, categories of Brahman, Rajanya, Vaishya, and Shudra. Uh, for example, traditionally, doctors, because of the fact that they were associated with service, were considered Shudra. But every human being, no matter what they do, is all the four of these categories. I think this is a very important uh, factor, and I think this this uh, issue is what has uh, left uh, a lot of people, um, firstly, in uh, knots about uh, understanding of all of this, and also I think has harmed uh, India's uh, progress. So, in any event. Um, um, it's um, time for Indian academics and associations to uh, be dedicated to um, progress, to not keep on waiting for uh, scholars in Germany or England or the US to change their books, because they'll do what they're comfortable doing. People have to write books in India, and they have to write it with energy and dedication to give Another example, um, India, Indian culture um, went and interacted with other cultures in Central Asia and um, through the translations of Indian texts in, from Sanskrit to Chinese, for example, had a great influence on um, the, uh, the classical Chinese civilization. And likewise, there apparently were uh, um, scholars or individuals who went uh, northwest, because we find uh, uh, many Sanskrit terms in the Slavic uh, system. It's not, now of course, part of them could, uh, could belong to a much earlier period, 
but uh, um, but there are in the medieval times also before the conversion of um, the Slavic world to Christianity, their religion uh, was uh, kind of Vedic. Their chief god was Parjanya or Parkonis, they called him. And uh, in fact, uh, one of the chief deities was, was Shvetavid. And I'm using the Slavic term, Shvetavid, meaning the knower of light. Uh, with four heads, heads just like Brahma, four heads. And they are called Moksha, um, Swarga, um, Parkonis, and um, there was another one which uh, uh, doesn't come to my mind right now. So what uh, Indians have to do is not just uh, be looking at Indian texts, which is wonderful, and a lot of people have to do that, Indian scholars must also look at um, Sanskritic and Sanskrit-inspired uh, material in Central Asia, in the Slavic world, uh, in ancient Europe, um, and uh, certainly in Xinjiang, which was uh, the place from where uh, these scholars through the kingdoms of Khotan and Turfan and others in the present-day Xinjiang, it wasn't called Xinjiang then, where until 1006, uh, this area was not Turkish-speaking. In fact, the languages were sort of uh, North Indian. Uh, there was Gandhari, there was uh, what is called Buddhist hybrid Sanskrit, and there was Khotanese. Um, and in fact, uh, there are traditions within uh, Khotan and Tibet that uh, a a colony of uh, Indians had been established there uh, after Ashoka. So this went back very early. And the names were, of course, uh, Sanskritic right until 1006. And when the kingdom of Khotan, for example, fell, um, before that, uh, they gathered all their texts and hid them in caves, which were discovered only 120 years ago. And that's why we have extensive material in Sanskrit and in translated materials um, on which many, many Western scholars have worked over the past hundred years. There are very few Indian scholars have worked on it. Why, why not? There are hundreds of uh, Indian colleges and universities with Sanskrit departments. Why don't heads of these departments in consultation with their younger faculty get sit down and demarcate uh, areas of scholarship and uh, inspire or encourage people to work. And now it's so much easier because in the past, one of the problems that one can imagine was that we didn't have the source materials in Indian libraries, but now a lot of it is available at one's fingertips. It's all on the internet. Much of it is freely available. So there's no reason why one shouldn't do that. And not only in the cultural field, in the scientific field, in interaction with West Asia, the Mitannids of the second millennium BCE, uh, apparently um, were Sanskritic. And in fact, this was a period prior to the development of the uh, West Asian uh, religious tradition from which Judaism and Christianity and Islam have emerged. So there's a lot that needs to be done. And there's a lot of interesting stuff on which um, great European scholars have worked in the past, and one can use that as a foundation and uh, move beyond. And uh, I was shocked uh, a couple of years ago uh, to discover uh, I was speaking at a very large gathering, and I was talking about Kanada's um, Vaisheshika Sutras. Indian physicists have not even heard about it. Why not? Every Western scholar goes back to um, the fount of uh, Western scientific uh, tradition goes back to Aristotle and goes back to um, uh, the, um, the, the early mathematicians, um, but or Pythagoras. Well, Indian scholars don't do that at all. I think Indians are still laboring under this great burden of this, the, these ideas which are a part of Indian college and school edi uh, education, which is based on Western look into India. It's not an Indian view of India. And sadly, in spite of 
past 50, 60 years, NCERT, etc. These uh, wrong notions have only been perpetuated until um, Indians have Atma Vishwas. India cannot be Atma Nirbhar. And for Atma Vishwas, the whole education system needs to be changed. And you cannot just depend on the government to do it. Individual scholars must do it. Everybody must participate in it. They have to know uh, their texts much better. They, they must uh, also take advantage of technology now. In the past, um, just to get um, one's hands on the on the books was difficult, but now a lot of that is not a problem. It is in the public domain. Uh, and um, this other uh, problem that I believe is the fact that people have to learn English before they get into their own um, uh, texts. Certainly that happens in sciences, for example, you have to learn English before you can learn programming, which is something that's not done in any other civilization. The Japanese do their programming, uh, they just, their programmers need not know English, they learn, they have Japanese and then they get into computer programming. The Chinese do it with Chinese. Indians are the only ones and Indians need or are made to do it even in their own Sanskritic or Vedic studies. All the Sanskrit conferences, the language of, uh, of, of business is English. Um, in India, as uh, a, a, a scholar has said, in India what we have, um, and perhaps uh, the, way, the reason why I'm speaking in English is a part of it, what we have is English apartheid. So there is this English world and then there is everybody else and therefore it's a big challenge. People have to climb over this mountain of knowing English before they can do various things. Um, all the Western classics should also be translated into Indian languages. And there could be some scholars um, who could be doing the greatest work in Indian languages. And that's the way it should be. And there have been great scholars who have worked in uh, Hindi and Marathi and Tamil and uh, Telugu and Bengali. Um, but the pressure of, Eng of English apartheid is so strong that that uh, area is becoming smaller, that space is becoming smaller and smaller. And something needs to be done uh, to change that and uh, for, for, for various reasons, we keep on depending on the government to be doing things. Well, the government has, uh, has uh, control over many things in India, partly because India is so centralized, which is not the case elsewhere because in, uh, I would imagine, in an American university, I could write a PhD dissertation in Hindi or Sanskrit, then if the committee said that it was fine and they could understand it, that'll be fine. Uh, but in India, you can't do it. In India, you can't go to the Supreme Court and argue in Hindi, let alone any other English language, any other Indian language. The only language allowed is English. So India has sort of tied its hands at the back. India cannot compete on equal terms with the rest of the world until one breaks these chains which India has put on its own hands. And uh, for that, um, much will have to be done um, by, the, uh, by, the, by the leaders or members also of waves. Uh, it's also a question of informing people because people are not well informed. Politicians are not very well informed. Uh, they, there is this simplistic belief which has been assiduously pushed by the Indian elite that all that you need for success is the English language, which is totally stupid. The language uh, is, English language is like any other language. What is required is Atma Vishwa so that you can do things. So you have products, like the Chinese have products or the Japanese and the Koreans have products. India doesn't have any products because Indian elite kept on pushing this narrative that uh, one advantage is English, so we can just do back office work for the rest of the world. Now, as we know, there was a foolish idea that's not served as well. We need to change. We need to be more, uh, have more self-confidence 
and we need to um, have self-confidence in all directions and knowing our past, knowing um, the Vedas, because the Vedas are this extraordinary uh, wisdom which connect us uh, to our inner world, but also encourage total openness and the scientific attitude to look at the outer world. So why not uh, know all that for what it is rather than depend on uh, superficial uh, narratives on it, which were written by Western scholars uh, some time ago and which have been perpetuated uh, in India over the last 70 years and have in fact made the situation worse. Because prior to independence, some of the great world scientists like uh, like the Boses, J.C. Bose, S.N. Bose, Raman, uh, Ramanujan, and many, many others, Saha, uh, they were connected to the Indian scientific tradition. Uh, modern Indian scientists are not. So, uh, so maybe that is one explanation for why India in the last uh, 70 years has not made as much of a mark on the world scientific stage as India had done prior to independence, even though at that time, you know, people had almost no uh, funding. Uh, J.C. Bose uh, was given a closet next to the bathroom uh, when he came back from, uh, from England, and that's where he did some of the path-breaking work, and some of which was 50 or 60 years before time, his work on semiconductors. So uh, with this, uh, thank you very much for having given me this opportunity. And uh, I do hope that WAVES will, uh, will also have aspirations beyond just meeting uh, once every two years and uh, do some brainstorming and see what can be done uh, to promote uh, Sanskrit, to promote uh, Vedas, uh, back in India and do it in a fashion where you are also using technology and using technology makes it possible for uh, one to be less dependent on the government. I think that is something that should be one of our main things in the back of our mind. We want to do things as much as we can without dependence on the government uh, because that gives us freedom uh, and in fact uh, new modes of propagation of knowledge can be created by looking at uh, all the possibilities that exist, which go beyond the traditional brick and mortar um, university. And, uh, and what uh, could be done there? Could WAVES or an associated uh, organization create a website where all the great Indian classics, the Vedic and Sanskritic classics are there? Um, curated so that we know that it is um, good information um, on the internet. You have all kinds of information. So how do we make sure that what we have is uh, reliable? So if all that is done, that will be a wonderful thing. Thank you very much again and Namaskar. <laughs>